Well, hello everybody. This is Kurt Munson from HBM Encode. I'm the Engineering Manager here at HBM Encode. And we're going to talk today as part of our continuing webinar series about Encode software. Specifically today we're going to look at advanced use cases and capabilities for fatigue calculations in Encode Glyphworks. So why are we doing this? The point of the webinar today is to learn about how we can use Encode Glyphworks software to keep that thing right there from happening. This is the infamous Aloha Airlines flight that was flying in the uh, in the late 80s and turned into a convertible mid-air, a tragic occurrence uh, and one that um, could have been engineered against if different practices had been used. So our goal today is, is really to look at enabling technologies to help us understand this type of failure and also to engineer against it. Now the key thing to think about today is the title, Advanced Fatigue Calculations in ENCODE Glyphworks. We've had less advanced topics in previous webinars, like how do you get started using Glyphworks, for example. We've done this in, in other webinars. For today's session, we're going to focus on extending past the basic use cases into some advanced ones. So I'm assuming that you guys out there have done something with ENCODE software previously, or if not, you're, you're fast learners. So with that in mind, let's take a look at what we're actually going to talk about today. What's our agenda? First off, we're going to start by talking just very briefly about fatigue analysis and durability prediction. What's the engineering challenge and what engineering approaches can we take to ensuring product durability? And then secondly, we're going to look in more software-specific focus here at some advanced use cases or some features of ENCODE Glyphworks software for doing advanced durability analysis things. For example, we're really going to look at, at, at maybe five different areas today. First off, we're going to look at how do we extend our fatigue calculations from using strain gauge uniaxial data to extend that to using strain gauge rosettes. We'll talk a little bit about what is a strain gauge rosette and we'll look at how we can best use that data for structural durability applications inside ENCODE Glyphworks software. The second application we'll look at today is how do we do this back calculation of stress targets? In other words, maybe we do our fatigue analysis and then we find that some areas in our structure are marginal in life. So they need uh, structural improvements to meet life targets. And the question then is, to what extent should the stress be decreased? Or another way to put it is, if we're trying to reduce weight, to what extent can the stresses be increased and still meet our life target. So sometimes we call these back calculations or calculating stress targets. We'll look at that live today as well. Third thing we're going to look at is how do we control fatigue calculations by metadata? Now metadata is a key word in this. If you've used ENCODE software before, you know that metadata is a key enabling technology that allows us to do all sorts of really powerful things inside Glyphworks. Metadata literally means data about data. In other words, these, the, the data you can say is our strain gauge data, our measured data. Metadata is descriptive information about it, and we can use metadata to our advantage in calculations, and it really opens up a lot of powerful analysis capabilities. So we'll look at that yet today as well. Fourth, we'll look at using multiple events and durability schedules for doing fatigue calculations. We're going to start today with just a simple calculation of here's some time series data. Maybe it's one lap of a proving ground. How long do we expect, how many laps do we expect until failure occurs? We're going to extend though with this fourth bullet point to look at multiple events. So combinations of proving ground events or combinations of different customer usage profiles or some people call these durability schedules or duty cycles. So how can we look at combined events and their overall impact in fatigue using concepts like miner's rule for damage accumulation? We'll look at that today as well. And then lastly, we'll talk very briefly about fatigue editing for rig tests. So how can we apply the concepts of fatigue damage to accelerating rig tests? And at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. I hope I can respond to any questions that I raise along the way. So to do all this today, we're going to be using ENCODE software. And ENCODE software has three components. ENCODE Design Life on the left, Glyphworks in the middle, and Automation on the right. Design Life is for doing virtual durability calculations, looking at finite element models and the stresses, the virtual stresses in that to understand virtual fatigue life. Glyphworks in the middle is test data processing, 
and then automation on the right is test data management. The beauty of these webinars is we can focus very specifically on one component of ENCODE software, GlyphWorks in this case today, and also we can focus on one very vertical application inside GlyphWorks, and that is fatigue and durability calculations, and even further, the advanced uses of those. Not how do we get started, but how do we extend past what we know into some advanced techniques. So this is where we're going with software today. In an engineering perspective, what we're trying to guard against or understand today is fatigue and durability. So here we have a, a picture of a, uh, a, a, looks like a tubular weldment. And uh, it might be hard to see due to screen resolution. But right in the middle there is a crack, a particularly nasty crack coming off of a weld in a very high stressed area that is going to be a, a critical concern at some point. So the goal is to, to understand that phenomena of fatigue uh, failure and also to guard against it and recommend design improvements and such so we have a durable product. So we're going to look today at, we'll talk about various methods for fatigue calculations, stress life, strain life, crack growth. We have applications that we extend into uh, uh, vibration fatigue and weld fatigue. And we have other webinars to discuss, say, weld fatigue in depth. We're not going to get into that in depth. In general, what we're going to look at today is fatigue analysis in general and some advanced use cases, as I described earlier, to try to answer the question of when does a crack start and how will a crack grow. So this in mind, here's an example of a process in GlyphWorks of how we analyze measured strain gauge data. Now, a process like this is, is, is one thing in PowerPoint, but it's a whole other thing if we look at it live. So I'm going to jump over into, into uh, ENCODE GlyphWorks software here, and uh, we'll see how we can do these fatigue calculations. Now, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes just to lay the groundwork of how do we do fatigue in general, and then we'll spend the rest of our time today looking at those advanced use cases I outlined earlier. So this is GlyphWorks. I expect that most of you have seen this before since this class is called Advanced. If you haven't, just very briefly, what we have is, is glyphs. These are functions for doing engineering analysis. Uh, we also have on this other panel, we have measured time series data. We're going to be looking at some strain gauge data today. We've got all kinds of other engineering applications for measured test data, vibration analysis and such, that are really outside of the scope of today's webinar, but we have covered in other webinars as well. So what I've introduced here is the concept of glyphs or functions and measured data. And all that will mix together in this graph paper area over here that we call the workspace. So to get started, I'm going to take this strain gauge data, drag and drop it in here to make my first input glyph. And here's some strain gauge data, right? So this is strain on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. This is what I will call for the rest of the day a squiggly line. These are Measured data always ends up looking like these squiggly lines. So some dynamic strain readings here. And our goal is to un understand the fatigue content of that, how long until failure. So I will use a couple of different glyphs here to understand that. Go down to the fatigue section. And we'll use the strain life glyph. Go ahead and connect that in this way, like this. And it's got a number of inputs, a number of outputs. For example, this will allow me to look at the rainflow histogram, the damage histogram, the fatigue results. So it just comes down now to putting a couple of display glyphs on here to best see what these answers are. And then we need to configure this process with a couple of fatigue parameters such that the measured data that I have and the fatigue calculation I'm going to use make sense together. To configure this calculation, I'll go into the strain life glyph and its properties. Some glyphs have a few properties. The strain life glyph has a lot of properties because there are a lot of different ways that people wish to configure their fatigue calculation to fit their own needs. One of the key factors that we need to think about here is on the materials tab. And that is, that's measured strain gauge data we had there, but what is this structure actually made out of? Because different types of steel, different types of aluminum and such, all fatigue in different ways. So I'm going to pick this carbon steel here. This is out of the ENCODE materials database. And uh, it's a user-extendable materials database uh, for those of you that have your own materials data. If you don't, then we have quite a long list here, as you can see, of material fatigue curves. Anyway, this allows me to establish fatigue behavior of the material. We have structural response here. I can run this process now. 
It's going to take just a minute to process those channels. And what we end up with then is a couple of glyphs here with, with answers, fatigue answers. So let me just expand this a bit so we can see better what kind of answers we have. I'm going to look at the results this way. Okay, so what we have now is the five strain gauge channels that we analyzed. Each one of them has been rainfall cycle counted and damage per cycle and miner's rule and all that stuff has happened inside this strain life glyph here. What this then reports back to me in this table is the fatigue results. That's what the pad was called, right? Fatigue results. So this is one row for every channel, five strain gauges, and in the excuse me, among the results we have here are things like how many repeats to failure or what's the life in hours. So let's look at these two answers here first. Results in terms of repeats to failure. This is repeats of the time series. So if this were, say, one lap of my proving ground, we're predicting failure in this location. This strain gauge was called the upper corner strain, wherever that was on my part. We're predicting failure in about 16,000 repeats, 16,000 laps before a crack starts. This result over here, life in hours, is the same type of information, but it's calibrated in hours because since this data is in the time domain, the conversion of laps into hours is simple, right? So that's been done for us. It's saying about 2,700 hours before failure. So you can see the lowest fatigue life is actually the first strain gauge in this case, 16,000 laps to failure. So this is the basic way we build a process in GlyphWorks to analyze fatigue behavior. I'm using the strain life glyph here. If we wanted to use the stress life glyph, it would be as simple as just repair, uh, replacing this with the other. They work about the same way. The math is a bit different. Uh, in some of our other webinars, we've discussed the difference between stress life and strain life. And I'm not going to do that now in, based on time, but it's as simple as replacing one glyph with another. These results here that I have with the histogram, let's just take a quick look at them. This was what was called the damage histogram and the rainflow histogram. Make these a little bit bigger. And what we have here at the bottom, this is the number of cycles that were counted by rainflow cycle counting versus how big they were. What was the cyclic range and what was the cyclic mean of each of those cycles? So we have a lot of small cycles, a moderate amount of medium-sized cycles, and we hope not too many big cycles. Up at the top here, this is the fatigue damage that's caused by each of those cycles. You can see the preponderance of small cycles actually doesn't mean anything in a fatigue sense because they fall below the endurance limit of the material. What matters more is the moderate count of moderate cycles and the small count out here is particularly important, the small count of big cycles. So this can help us understand, we can dig into the, the, the fatigue calculation here a bit and understand what's the relationship between small to large cycles and how important are those in, uh, in a fatigue sense. So this is the way I do a fatigue calculation inside GlyphWorks. Now this is not an advanced use case in any way, but I need to cover this just so we, we're all on the same page of how does GlyphWorks operate. What I want to do now is take a step back into PowerPoint here and extend past this basic use of GlyphWorks fatigue and into the five advanced use cases I highlighted briefly just a minute ago. One of those use cases was what do we do with strain gauge rosettes? So the key thing about a strain gauge rosette is it, it provides additional information about directions and complicated stress states that uniaxial strain gauges don't. The calculation I just did was based on five uniaxial strain gauges. In other words, I was responsible for finding hotspots on my structure, and also not just hotspots, but directions of highest stress. And then I place and orient the strain gauge according to those that information. Now, if I don't know what direction the highest stress is, I need to use a rosette. And a rosette looks like this thing down in the lower left corner. And I actually end up collecting three pieces of strain data, three channels, leg one, leg two of this rosette. And I can use that information using, say, Moore's circle, if you recall that from, from school. I can resolve from these three directional stresses or strains into more critical or more useful components of stress or strain, like, for example, a principal stress. So two approaches to using rosettes are, number one, I can take my three channels of strain gauge data and use the concept of Moore's circle and principal stress transformations to calculate 
what is the strain in the in a direction that causes it to be largest? That direction is called the principal angle, and that strain that results in that direction is called the principal strain. And we can use that in our fatigue calculation. Now the challenge of that is that actually every single time step in our calculation is another Mohr circle. Every time step in our measured data is another Mohr circle, which means then that the principal angle can be shifting over time. So it may be that uh, a secondary approach, a different approach to using strain rosettes, may be useful if we have the principal angle changing over time. The challenge of, of, of principal angle mobility or, or change is that if tensile strains or normal stresses and strains cause cracks to start, if the strains are changing direction, then what direction does the crack start in and what direction does it grow in? And that leads us to our second approach, which is some, some people call this a critical plane approach. And that says, let's resolve strains into a bunch of different directions. Let's, let's resolve into a zero degree coordinate system, and then a 10 degree, and then a 20 degree, and 30 degree, and so on. So we're going to take three ga gauges of strain gauge data and resolve into a whole bunch of different independent directions, use them all in a separate fatigue calculation, and then the one that's got the shortest fatigue life is the critical direction or the critical plane, and we'll report that. So let me just show you what this looks like inside GlyphWorks. Hop back into GlyphWorks here. We've been assuming all along that our strain gauge data is uniaxial strain gauges. But let's now look at the case of maybe the first three channels here, the red, blue, and green. Maybe they belong to a rosette. So I'm going to disconnect this. We have a glyph for strain gauge rosette analysis. That's this one right here. So one of the nice features of GlyphWorks is that if I want to add additional functions to my calculation, I just drag and drop new glyphs in. In this strain rosette, then, I'll take a look. And it will ask me questions like, what type of rosette are we working with? Is it a rectangular or a delta rosette? I can look in my logbook or think back to how I installed this strain gauge and remind myself that it's a rectangular rosette. Also, what channels go together? What are the three channels that work together to define one rosette? In my case, it was channel number 90, 91, and 92. If I had multiple rosettes, I could put them in in these, in these, these pairs, or these, I guess it would be a triad, uh, in these parentheses this way. The um, output channels tab here allows me to select what components of stress from this complicated stress tensor do I want to look at. So I'm going to select just the strain components, and let's look only at the principle. Look at what's called the absolute max principle. And I'm going to put a display glyph on so we can actually see that. And notice that if this is the principal strain that's going to be calculated by this rosette, we're going to be looking at it here and also using it in our fatigue calculation. So we've just added the concept of the rosette into the previous calculation I did. We'll run this and we'll see what happens. So now, here's my rosette. This is the absolute maximum principal strain for a rosette that was designed, that was defined by collected channels. 90, 91, 92. This is the strain in the principal angle, and that's been given to the fatigue calculation. So now the fatigue answers here, instead of having five uniaxial strain gauges, we have a fatigue calculation done for one single rosette. And it says the fatigue life is about 2,100 repeats, or 340 hours to failure. So now I've built on my uniaxial process to incorporate multiaxial or rosette calculations as well. Now, the second approach in the rosette that I mentioned before was the critical plane, which said let's resolve into a bunch of separate angles and calculate in a, each direction, critical plane approach, and we'll find the one that has the highest damage or the shortest life. That is easy for me to change here. I just need to tell it, instead of calculating the, the max principle, I want to resolve my strains to an angle, not just any angle, but a series of critical planes. So specified angles would say maybe I want to resolve to the strain that's perpendicular to a weld. Well, in my case, I want to resolve into all possible planes and then find the critical one. So I'll select this to critical plane and OK and rerun this. Calculation takes a little bit longer this time because when I said critical plane, it actually calculated strains in 10 degree increments from 0 degrees to 180 degrees.
So I actually have a number of strain channels here. Now let's just look at, say, four of them. Strain at 0, 10, 20, 30, and so on degrees. So my calculation is actually taking into account all possible directions of strain, as if I had put down 18 uniaxial strain gauges, and I'm trying to find what direction is the strain the highest in, and therefore what direction has the most critical fatigue problem associated with it. I can see here then that the life in repeats per angle is shown here. I can sort this in ascending order. So the shortest fatigue life is 2,190 repeats, and that happens to be in the 150 degree angle. So I'm expecting a crack to grow perpendicular to that orientation relative to my rosette that I started with. So this has been just a little bit of the concept of how do I take my uniaxial strain gauge data and then expand my process into working with rosettes. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here now and look at the second calculation. And that is, our second use case is back calculating stress targets. So how much does the stress need to change to meet a target life? So the first thing we did today, or what we've been doing so far, is calculating how long until failure is predicted. But let's turn that around. What if the calculation we do says that failure is more eminent than we desire it to be? Maybe we would like our product to last 30,000 repeats, but our process only finds that it, it's predicting a failure at 16,000 repeats. So if I am the analyst here, and I run my calculations, and I say, oh, oh this uh, one particular area, or a couple of areas, our, our life is not going to be met. Strains and stresses are too high. Now, if I review this with a designer, and I say the life is too short, they will say, okay, well, why don't you fix that? And then I'll say, but you're the designer, you ought to fix that. If I give them, if I say the life needs to increase by some factor, they may not necessarily be able to put that into action. But if I were to say we need to reduce the stress by 10% or by 20% or 30%, if I could provide a stress reduction target, that is the kind of thing that a designer typically knows, understands. Reduction in stress makes sense. So what we're going to do now is look at this question of on this teeter-totter with life and stress, what's that relationship between life and stress? How much do I need the, the stress to reduce to balance our life target? So let's go back into GlyphWorks here. And I'm going to use the same calculation as before. I'm going to take the rosette stuff out, though. That was the last use case. We can get rid of that now. I'm going to connect my uniaxial strain gauge data in here. And just as a reminder, the first calculation we did today showed that the shortest fatigue life was strain gauge number one, and it had a life of about 16,000 repeats to failure. And let's say that our our design target is 30,000 repeats to failure, so we're, we're a little short. Now, some of these exceed our life target, which is a good sign, but, but this one string gauge does not, and that could be a problem. So let's go figure out how the stress should be modified or reduced to meet this life target. So this is what we call a back calculation in our fatigue glyph. So let's just pop this up here. It said at the very top here, the mode, the calculation mode here, is we're calculating damage, we're calculating life, how long until failure. But let's turn this around, and let's calculate a stress scale factor. Calculate a scale factor. The properties change here in a bit, and it now says, what's the target life? So I'll say 30,000 repeats. 30,000 repeats to failure. So let's not calculate life, let's calculate a stress that's going to allow that life target to be met. I'll rerun this. It's going to take a little bit longer because it actually has to iteratively solve the process. It's going to iteratively solve for each of these strain gauges. Notice now the fatigue lives are all about 30,000 repeats within a, within a percent. So it's calculated back or, or iteratively solved into a tolerance of 1%. So the life is not what we're really after. What we're really after as we look through all these results is over here at the end is scale factor. So let's just take a quick look. I'm going to put this back into scaling this by, or put this into a channel order this way. So by channel, you can see the scale factor that meets our life target of 30,000. You can see the stress needs to be scaled by a factor of 0.87 to meet our life target. So to go from 16,000 repeats to 30,000, we need the stress to be reduced 
Uh, and as a matter of fact, it needs to be reduced by about 13%, it shows. Some of these other strain gauges here show that we by far exceeded the life target, so we can actually take weight out of this area. We can, re we can actually allow an increase of stress. Stress can go up by almost a factor of two or two and a half in some places. So this information for me to provide this back into design allows us to optimize the design so we don't have hot and cold spots. So we have targets that all, uh, we have spots that all meet our life target. So to be able to say we need to reduce the stress by 13%, the designer has something then they, they can work with and do, do a, a really a useful calculation that way. So that's what we call back calculations. And again, I got there just by looking, setting up this process to calculate the scale factor rather than damage. This is what we call a back calculation instead of a forward fatigue damage calculation. All right, the next advanced use case to look at is we're going to look at controlling fatigue properties by metadata. So if you've been around GlyphWorks before, you'll recognize the term metadata. This is data about data. So the time series data, the squiggly lines, that's the key to all this. But sometimes we may wish to include metadata, additional information that describes those channels, and we can use those on our fatigue calculations. For example, we may wish to assign different fatigue properties to different strain gauges. So earlier I picked a material. These five strain gauges are all put onto a structure made of a certain type of steel. What if, though, my component was made out of an aluminum casting and a steel weldment, and I had strain gauges all throughout that structure. So that means that I need to be able to associate different fatigue properties, different material fatigue curves, for example, to the aluminum strain gauges uh, and, and different ones also to the steel ones. So the process I'm going to show here looks like this. It's actually going to be easier for us to dig into live. So let me just jump back into to ENCODE here. And uh, I'm going to leave the processing as is, but I've got another tab down here. These are called workspaces. So within the process that I've, I've built here, I have these different workspaces, and this allows me then to, uh, to essentially be able to run different calculations kind of in parallel. This process that I have here, let me just start this from, from scratch here, um, allows me to put time series data in this way. And also I have an Excel spreadsheet that keeps track of channel information. So here's my Excel spreadsheet. Drag that in here. And um, the time series data, well, we've seen that before. That's, that's channel-based uh, squiggly lines. What's new here is this Excel spreadsheet. So let me just pop this up, take a look and see what it looks like here. Uh, this Excel spreadsheet allows me to input metadata, either test metadata that's, that describes all of this data that I've collected, or channel-specific metadata down here. Let me pop up the Excel spreadsheet so you guys can see it. All right, so here's our spreadsheet. And what I've got in this spreadsheet is this is a spreadsheet I put together that has a column called channel. And these are my channels I want to analyze by number. And then all these other columns here are pieces of information. Essentially, this is going to be used as a lookup table. If I ever come across a channel called number 90, KF will be equal to 1. Material will be equal to carbon, steel, SAE, whatever that is. If I ever come across a channel number 91, KF will be 1.3, dual phase steel, so on and so forth. So a, a lot of engineers are used to keeping this kind of channel information or test details and such in an Excel spreadsheet. What I've done here is linked the Excel spreadsheet into GlyphWorks. And the cool thing about this then is that when I run this process, when I run this process, I have the same fatigue calculation as before, but now, the channel-based information from Excel is being merged with the time series data. That's the role of this metadata manipulation glyph. Tag, you could say. Tag information from Excel and squiggly lines from the time series input glyph. Push them together. And then inside the fatigue calculation here, take a look at these properties. I've set it up so, for example, when we come to the material right here, this says, go use the material that was given to me by Excel. So if you've been around, uh, around GlyphWorks before, you'll start to recognize these, these pound signs here. This is like a metadata reference. It says, for KF, 
use whatever I had in Excel for this channel. For the material, use whatever I had in Excel for that channel. So channel 90, we use one type of steel. Channel 91, we use a different, and so on and so forth. So I've opened up a lot of possibilities and flexibility in my analysis by using this idea of, of metadata. And you can see those answers here. You can see for the five channels I've calculated, we have fatigue lives, like before. And you can see here that the KF, stress concentration factor, the material fatigue curve that's being used, and the preload or, or, or residual stress has been changed by location or by strain gauge as well. So using this concept of, a, of an Excel spreadsheet here and having additional information or metadata, and then tagging that metadata onto my squiggly lines, and then using all that information together in the strain life cliff such that I can control the way the calculations is done. This is a really powerful technique inside Glyphworks, and it really opens up a lot of possibilities for using a, what looks to be a simple process, but having a lot of additional controls over how calculations are done for each channel along the way. By the way, as we work through some of these examples today, I just want to point out that if you take a look in our Glyphworks work examples, that's right over here under manuals, Glyphworks work examples, we have a number of work examples that talk about these exact use cases. So this is something you can go back and replicate at your desk when you, uh, when you want to or when you have time to dig further into this. Okay, the fourth use case today, fourth advanced use case, is we're going to look at schedule damage summation or working with multiple data files. And what this will do is allow us to use a series of data files in here but look at combined or total damage using miner's rule. So, so far we've been looking at one, one lap, how many laps until failure, but, but re repetitive, just that lap. And realistically, most data you process will come in, in, in smaller segments, and it might be like 10 different data files. One is the high-speed loop, and another is the uh, city loop or, or low-speed driving or off-road course or bump track and, and so on. And, and you might have a what some people call it a durability profile or durability schedule or duty cycle that says that there are varying repeats like a mix of all these different events that make up a year in the life of our part. So we're going to look now at how we can use this idea of, of a schedule or a duty cycle and add up damage across all these different events so then we can capture not just the fatigue behavior of one type of use case or one data file but a combination of, of multiples. So let's just jump back into Glyphworks here. And I'm going to go back to my original process that I started. And just like I'd done before, I'm going to change a few things here. Delete this. Um, what's important here is instead of working with this one data file, I'm actually going to work with a series of data files. So I've got four here. This is from com some construction equipment. So I've got backfilling, digging, plowing, and transport. Four different ways that a customer uses our vehicle. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to get rid of the data in my process, remove that, and I'm going to put all four of these in here like this. All four data files are in there. Typically when I put four data files in input glyph, if I run that, then I'll end up calculating four times. I'll get fatigue lives four times. What I want to do here though is run it once and look at a sum of damage across all, of all four of those. So in the properties here, a couple of changes to make. First off, here are my four data files. I can associate repeat counts. So let's say we had uh, uh, 150 counts of the first of backfilling. And then to that we have 566 counts of digging and uh, 288 uh, repeats of plowing. And then transport happens maybe 900 times in a life. Now this information, I'm just making this up as I go, but your company may have some, un or well, I hope has some understanding of what an actual year in the life of or a design target is and what this mix is by doing some kind of customer profiling. So I associate repeats there and then on the advanced tab I tell it I want to combine all these data files together. Stick them together. Okay? The key thing is don't check this display box because if I do that, 
Glyphworks says, oh, you must want to look at this combined data file, and it'll stitch together all of these data files with all those repeats, and it'll take a while and be a pain. So don't do that. So leave this display turned off, but, but change this combined to true, and associate any repeat counts that we need. Okay? So that's one step. Second step, inside our fatigue calculation, we need to tell it to do a damage sum across a schedule. So this is what we call the schedule damage mode. And I'm going to tell it, yes, I want to work with a schedule. Say true to this. Okay? Do that. And then the answers will come out of this bottom pad here. You may have never even noticed this pad, but it's called schedule results. And we look at that with what we call a data values display glyph. Let's go grab that. Like this. Okay, so here we go. So our calculation. Let it run. It's going to process for just a little bit. And when it's done, it will give me a calculation that says what's the combined damage content for all of these runs together. So let's take a look at our results here. We have uh, channel number 90. We have results for channel number 90 for backfilling, digging, plowing, transport, and then there's sum. Okay? Actually, you know what? I forgot to do something. I still have this back calculation mode on. Whoops. Let's go do this. So I essentially back calculated what's the stress reduction needed to meet that life target. And I actually want to set this to damage. I forgot about that. Let's rerun this here. And okay, there we go. So here are our results. It says here's how much damage comes from each of these different events. And here's the total. Well, that total actually comes from calculating damage for one repeat of backfilling and multiplying by 150. And then one repeat of digging multiplying by 566, and so on. So you can see that we're using miner's rule to our advantage. We don't have to string together days and days and days worth of data with large repeat counts and such. We don't have to make a huge, long time series just to calculate damage, because miner's rule says that if we have something happening repetitively, if we keep on backfilling, then damage just increases linearly with time or with repeats. So this is making the most of small amounts of data, large repeat counts, and miner's damage sum. In the end, here's our total damage. It says total damage is 0 0.025, so that means that's about 2.5% uh, of the life is used up by one schedule repeat. In other words, do some math there, the reciprocal of uh, 0 0.025 is 40. That means our life is 40 schedule repeats to failure. Right? So we're predicting 40 of these total repeated, that sum altogether, 40 times that bunch of, you could say, block before failure. And it's also interesting, we can dig in and see what's the percent damage contribution per event. We can see very quickly here that transport and plowing don't mean anything structurally, at least in, in this particular strain gauge, in this particular location. It's digging and backfilling that hurt the most. So that allows us to look at things like maybe we need to collect more data around digging, learn more about that. Or if we're making a structural durability test, maybe we don't need to waste time on the test rig with plowing and transport because their contribution to damage is very small. So this is what we call the schedule damage summation mode. And it, it got this way because I put in multiple data files here and associated repeats. As a reminder, don't check this display box because it'll then try to plot out that long, long time series data as opposed to working in small, efficient chunks. You can also use this calculation with what we call a schedule file. Some of you may be familiar with this app over here on the left called Schedule Create, where we can build up a series of repeats and time series data and such, and we can use that in our calculation. It's uh, two different ways to get to the same calculation. If you want to know more about this, by the way, this is described in worked example number 22. All right, last advanced use case of the day. Let's talk briefly here about ways to use damage to accelerate durability tests. So durability testing comes in many different flavors. Uh, it may be that the part you're going to test is tested with a simple cyclic load. This is usually done with... This is usually done with with a, a simple, um, say, structural parts that are loaded uniaxially and uh, um, don't behave dynamically. Or it might be a block cycle test where we have a, a uniaxial load but varying in content a couple of times. 
These topics, by the way, block cycle testing, we've covered in additional webinars, and uh, and uh, we're not going to get into detail here today. <coughs> Uh, what we're going to look at right now is um, how we can use this concept of damage to edit data in the time domain such that we can run time domain simulation tests. The last use case at the bottom here, by the way, this is for shaker tests, and we've got another webinar on that coming up shortly. So I'm just going to focus on this one right here in the middle. So the way this works is we can use the concept of damage calculations to figure out what time segments are not worth reproducing on the test rig. So this is a fantastically expensive and complicated and capable test rig up here that is driven by time domain data, time domain data like this. Now the challenge of this test rig is that, number one, they're expensive to run, and number two, if we're trying to ensure a long durability life in the time domain, we can end up spending a lot of time running a test. So the less time we run on our test, the better. So a common question is, is there some way we can abbreviate or shorten this time series data, remove the non-damaging cycles, uh, such that the time data that we're going to actually input into this test rig doesn't take so long. In other words, remove the dead time on the proving ground where the drivers uh, stopped waiting for traffic or turned around or approaching bumps, just keep the bumps and so on. What this looks like inside Glyphworks is what I've got on this tab right here. So I've put some time series data in here. I run this process. This is um, a strain life fatigue calculation here. What's unique is this glyph here, the damage editing glyph. In here I tell it I want to keep only damaging segments. So let's take a quick look here at what this looks like. I want to look in five second long windows. Which chunks of time or five second windows can I get rid of? and still maintain, say, 95% of the damage. The way this works is the fatigue calculation glyph here, the one we've been using all along right here, since it can calculate cycles and damage, and it, since it has time domain data, it can look at the rate of damage accumulation in the time domain. The damage editing glyph then can say, let's look for areas where there's no damage accumulating. So areas where there's no damage accumulating, that's plotted here in this graphical editor glyph. Areas where there's no significant damage accumulating are highlighted in this blue. Areas that are uh, where damage is accumulating are unhighlighted. And the graphical editor glyph has been set up to delete these highlighted segments, delete the non-damaging segments. So in the end, the data I have here at the top is the original data. At the bottom is the edited data, and you can see here the original time series data has significant chunks of time where nothing was happening in the fatigue sense. Those have been automatically edited out, and you can see the duration of this data file is now about uh, 60 seconds compared to the 580 seconds to begin with. So the time has been drastically reduced. This is the data file then that I will reproduce in the test rig. So effectively now I'm running my bump course of proving ground data 10 times faster than I did previously by editing out the dead times. So this is what we call the fatigue editing concept in Glyphworks. It's an interesting extension of all this fatigue stuff we've been calculating today. The last thing I'll point out is that a lot of what we've done today is uh, described in worked examples. So as I showed before, if you look on the lower left of Glyphworks under Manuals, there's an icon for Glyphworks Work Examples. Numbers 7, 21, and 22 all describe various uses like I've shown today. So this is a resource for you to take a look at. I encourage you to do so. If you haven't already seen these work examples, there's a lot you can learn from there. So at this point, I want to turn over to a question and answer session. I need to review some questions that have come in here. So uh, give me just a, a minute to do that, and I'll do the best I can.